In this video, I want to talk about ketogenesis. But it's important to make sure that at all times we have glucose in the bloodstream. We need to maintain a blood glucose concentration. Why? Well, the brain requires glucose for it to function properly. The brain requires glucose as a source of energy. And the brain gets its glucose from the bloodstream. So therefore, we need to make sure we have glucose in the bloodstream to keep the brain happy. However, what happens if we fasted for a couple of hours and haven't eaten a meal for a while? Our blood glucose concentrations will drop, which is dangerous because now the brain doesn't have a source of energy. So essentially what happens once the blood glucose concentrations drop is the pancreas senses that. The pancreas senses that the glucose concentrations have dropped and in response it releases glucagon. Now that glucagon works to tell the cells, hey, the blood glucose concentrations have dropped so we need to find a way to restore those blood glucose concentrations. So one way we do that is the glucagon first tells the liver to use its glycogen stores to restore blood glucose concentrations. But once those glycogen stores run out, now glucagon tells the liver to go through gluconeogenesis. So gluconeogenesis is when we take these carbon intermediates and use these as a source of carbons to biosynthesize glucose molecules. And again, this gluconeogenesis is stimulated by glucagon. So now the liver is taking these carbon sources as a source of carbons to biosynthesize glucose molecules. Now we're biosynthesizing glucose molecules, which we can dump in the bloodstream to keep the brain happy. However, this is an anabolic process. To biosynthesize these glucose molecules, this is anabolic and requires a lot of ATP. So where do we get all the ATP to fuel gluconeogenesis? Well, we need to burn fat. So glucagon also tells the adipocytes to go through lipolysis, where we hydrolyze these bonds, releasing free fatty acids. Now these free fatty acids can enter the liver, particularly in this liver hepatocyte, particularly in the mitochondria. Now, again, now the free fatty acid can enter a process known as beta oxidation, where we essentially take that free fatty acid and oxidize it. When we oxidize it, we create reduced cofactors like NADPH, uh, NADH and FADH2, which can fuel the electron transport chain to create ATP. But the point is, we take these free fatty acids, go through beta oxidation to create ATP. Now we've created ATP to fuel gluconeogenesis. And again, it's glucagon stimulating this process of beta oxidation. But the point is, we burn these fats to create ATP to fuel gluconeogenesis. However, as we go through beta oxidation, we're creating a lot of these acetylcholine molecules. As we oxidize these free fatty acids, we create these acetylcholine molecules. So what do we do with all these acetylcholine molecules? Well, normally what we do is we take acetylcholine, bind it with oxaloacetate, and go through the citric acid cycle, go through the Krebs cycle. However, oxaloacetate is one of those carbon sources which are used for gluconeogenesis. All these oxaloacetate molecules are used, these carbons in these oxaloacetate molecules are used to biosynthesize glucose molecule as a source of carbons to biosynthesize these glucose molecules. So all these oxaloacetate molecules are being funneled towards gluconeogenesis. So now we don't have any oxaloacetate, so now we can't bind with acetylcholine and go through the Krebs cycle. So what's gonna happen to all these acetylcholine molecules? Well, we're gonna keep on doing beta oxidation to create the ATP to fuel gluconeogenesis, so we're gonna keep on doing beta oxidation and we're gonna create a lot of acetylcholine. Eventually, the concentrations of acetylcholine are gonna increase and then eventually we're gonna go through the process known as ketogenesis, where we take these carbons in acetylcholine to biosynthesize keto acids. And again, this is simulated by glucagon. So now what's happening is the liver is biosynthesizing these keto acids and biosynthesizing glucose. So glucose enters the bloodstream to keep the brain happy, while those keto acids enter the bloodstream as a source of energy for other cells and other tissues. For example, let's say this very generic cell can take these keto acids, convert them to acetylcholine, and now this acetylcholine can enter the Krebs cycle to essentially create reduce cofactors to fuel the electron transport chain to create ATP. So the point is this cell can take these keto acids as a source of energy to create ATP. So how exactly in this liver hepatocyte, how exactly in, in this mitochondria, how do we take these acetylcholine molecules to biosynthesize keto acids? What exactly is the mechanism of how we do this? Well, the first step is we take, again, remember, we're taking fatty acids and we're oxidizing them, creating a lot of acetylcholine molecules. So the first step is we take two of these acetylcholine molecules and react them together, catalyzed by this thiolase enzyme, to create acetoid acetylcholine. And if you're interested in the mechanism, essentially it's a simple Claisen condensation, where essentially we know this carbon has a hydrogen, so we take that hydrogen and we, and we essentially deprotonate it. 
we, we deprotonate this hydrogen and these electrons fall on this carbon. When we do that, we form one of these carbon anion nucleophiles. So now this carbon can nucleophilically attack this carbon. And when it nucleophilically attacks this carbon, it forms a bond. And when it forms that bond, it pushes these pi electrons up on this oxygen. And when we do that, we form this tetrahedral intermediate. Now what happens is these electrons scooch back down. When they fall back down, they reform that double bond. And when that double bond is reformed, now we break this bond and these electrons fall in the sulfur, essentially forming this compound. So just a typical Clayson condensation. Remember what we're doing. We're forming a bond and we're breaking a bond and these electrons fall in the sulfur. So again, we form a bond and then the electrons fall down and we break a bond. And now we formed our compound. So again, drawing it nicely. Now we form our acetoacetyl-CoA molecule. So now we can react this with another acetyl-CoA molecule. Because again, remember, we're creating a lot of these acetyl-CoA molecules through beta oxidation. And now we can react these, again, catalyzed by HMG-CoA synthase to form HMG-CoA. And again, we react these through a simple aldol condensation reaction. So again, we react them forming this compound. And again, if you're interested in the mechanism, again, we deprotonate this hydrogen, the electrons fall on the carbon, forming this carbon anion. So again, now we nucleophilically attack this carbon, forming that bond. So we form this bond, and when we do that, we push these pi electrons up on this oxygen. And when we do that, we form this tetrahedral intermediate. And then again, we form this action anion, which is, is relatively basic. So again, it gets protonated. So now we form this compound. And now a water molecule floats around and goes through a simple hydrolysis, where again, we essentially, we hydrolyze this bond. So again, we nucleophilically attack, push the pi electrons up, electrons scooch back down. Now this bond breaks and these electrons fall in the sulfur. But essentially what happens is we form a bond and we break a bond. And again, when we do that, we form this compound. So now we formed our compound, drawing it nicely. Now we formed our HMG-CoA. And this HMG-CoA is really important. It, it's essentially a, a branch which can enter different pathways. It can either, this, this HMG-CoA can be used to biosynthesize cholesterol or can be used to biosynthesize keto acids. So how do we use this to biosynthesize keto acids? Well, the next step is we react this HMG-CoA with HMG-CoA lyase to essentially go through a reaction forming this acetoacetate and this acetyl-CoA. But it's this acetoacetate which we're interested in. This is the compound we're interested in, which is used to biosynthesize keto acids. So again, essentially what happens is we take this guy and it can go through different reactions catalyzed by different enzymes. So it can also go through this reaction catalyzed by this enzyme to biosynthesize acetone, but this acetone isn't really important. We don't really care about it. It's this reaction we're interested in, catalyzed by this enzyme. It's this reaction forming this hydroxybutyrate. And this is a keto acid. This is the keto acid. So this, so now we biosynthesize one of our keto acids. And we know this keto acid can be used as a source of energy. So again, remember this ketogenesis is in the liver, but now the liver can release those keto acids. So now it releases those keto acids. Now this cell can use this generic cell can use those keto acids to to as a source of energy to to create ATP. So how does the cell do it? Well, first it takes this hydroxybutyrate, do one quick modification to form this compound. Now with this compound reacted, but with this enzyme by this thiophorylase enzyme to create this compound. So now once we form this compound, essentially we can use this and essentially break it down to create two acetyl-CoA molecules. So now, now this cell took that, that keto acid, went through these reactions, and now it has these acetyl-CoA molecules. So what does the cell do with these acetyl-CoA molecules? Well, let's just focus on one. Let's just focus on one. We take this acetyl-CoA and we know it can enter the Krebs cycle. So now this cell essentially takes this keto acid breaks it down to acetyl-CoA molecules, which can enter the Krebs cycle. And when it enters the Krebs cycle, we know we create these reduced cofactors, which can fuel the electron transport chain to create ATP. So now essentially what's happening is this liver is going through ketogenesis by synthesizing these keto acids, which can enter the bloodstream and into new cells. And these cells can use these keto acids and essentially use them to create ATP. And it's important to realize is the liver can't use these keto acids because it doesn't have the enzymes to convert this keto acid to acetyl-CoA. And even if it could, remember that acetyl-CoA couldn't enter the Krebs cycle because we explained how the oxaloacetate is being used for gluconeogenesis in, in the liver cells. But again, this is the process of ketogenesis, how the liver biosynthesizes these keto acids as a source of energy that other cells can use.